going? No? Right. So, a new, new section in our term, meaning a new topic. Um, so we're going to ask, we're going to look at some questions um, about so-called international distributive justice. So these are issues quite separate from um, military intervention. Um, and um, there was some role for self-determination to be played in, but this is a larger question. So we're going to start it, it first from a larger perspective, and then when we talk about Altman and Wellman, we'll see that they bring the idea of self-determination into it. But it's, that's only a part of it. So, um, justice, right and wrong, distributive meaning right and wrong about sort of how things are distributed, in our case, mostly money, um, wealth, opportunities, matter as well, but mostly money, and internationally across borders. Right? So that's basically what we're going to be looking at. So just inequality and poverty globally, what morally we should think about that. It's of course, it's a huge topic. Hugely important as well. There's enormous amounts of inequality internationally. Um, especially in this election cycle, people like to complain a lot about in inequality within a society like ours, but it's nothing, it's absolutely nothing compared to what internationally happens. Um, the median US citizen makes about $50,000 a year. Mm -hmm. um, internationally, if you're within, if you're over 30,000, 30, you're within. I think the richest five percent of the world. So, being being fairly poor, sort of in the U.S., means being very very well off internationally. Uh, it's not to say that American you know, people who are poor don't have a hard life. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you look at it globally, these distributive issues are way more pressing than anything you might think about nationally. So, if you're concerned nationally, you should be really concerned internationally. If you're not concerned nationally, you should probably still be really concerned. Anyway, so we're going to look at what that might mean. So um, let's to get going. So here's the like a common idea. This is the part. This is the point where uh, Alman and Wellman will take it, take on later. Say, well, normally people think that self-determining countries have a right to choose how to deal with their inequality. Allow any of it. Allow none of it. Allow a lot of it. Allow some of it. And so on. Now, Pogi in the readings for today. Um, notes that there's a popular implication of this idea, right, which is <coughs> the flip side of it, not just that countries can choose how to deal with inequality, but also that if they choose, for example, to spend a lot of their resources on fighting domestic inequality and prioritize that over fighting inequality globally, that's okay too. So if you're going to be voting for Hillary, say, you probably hold a view like this. Right? If you were con considering voting for Bernie Sanders, you very likely hold a view like this. And it's really important that we spend a lot of money on making sure that inequality in America is reduced. Not nearly as much money to be spending to be spent on what inequality internationally is supposed to be reduced. And Puggy thinks, um, and Singer will see later, will see also think, both of them think, this is uh, something that's quite questionable. Maybe you should you should spend as much. Maybe you spend, should spend more internationally, but this idea that you should that more resources should go to the an American person who makes 15 grand a year, um, let's say federal poverty line is 14,000 and change, right right at the poverty line. Right? That more money should go to that person than to a person who lives on a dollar a day, right? So it's 365 dollars a year or less. That's a view they think is very problematic. You should not, you can't really hold. So they want to challenge that. If you challenge that, by the way, you are also challenging the idea that that is very uh, close to the heart of the theory of self-determination, right? that, so, that societies are, so, are more or less um, self-contained units, units within which ideas of justice get settled and that are more or less sort of in isolation of each other. Not that there are no rules between them, but that's much more limited. That is, what happens across borders is more limited in scope and nature than what happens within borders. Right, that's, your, that's your standard view. Pogi and especially Singer are trying to challenge that. So here's two questions, right? So if inequalities matter, do they primarily matter within a society or across? Um, and if we should fight them in, uh, globally, 
So if they also matter, or maybe matter as much, maybe matter even more internationally, then what might be left of self-determination? Right. So we're looking at the first one today, and both Singer and Foggy are going to claim, or argue to you that the answer is no, right? That inequality does not primarily matter within society, but they challenge this thought, right? I right, go straight at this idea that distributive justice or economic equality matters most, like really mostly within a certain society. So if you care about poor people, you should first care about people abroad, they think. And we'll see, this is the thing you see a lot, right? For example, um, think about outsourcing. Right? People hate outsourcing, generally speaking. I tend to agree with a lot of what Fogi and Singer are saying. I don't agree with all the arguments, I don't agree with it, but I agree with this particular point. So I actually am a fan of outsourcing. I, want, I, I think it's a good idea because um, usually outsourcing doesn't just mean that a person in the US or in Europe or whatever loses a job, it means that somebody in the third world is gaining a job. And those people generally benefit much more from it than the people lose who are losing their jobs. It's not to say that not bad news here, it is bad news here, but it's much better news over there. So I think while I prefer better news, <laughs> I prefer the better news over the not so bad, bad news. And so outsourcing is, it seems to me a great idea because it's really helping people who need it more. But that means right, that I reject this idea that inequality within a, our country, whether it be my, you know, the Netherlands back home or the US over here, that that matters more than, interna than international inequality. I actually think the international inequality matters more because it's a much greater problem. Now, if you disagree with me, and like with many of you, almost everyone disagrees with me. <laughs> Not so many philosophers, but outside of philosophy, lots of people disagree with me. Um, politicians all disagree with me. <laughs> Maybe Gary Johnson doesn't or something, but like, really, like that's a 5% per like, slice of the vote. Like, 95% of the electorate disagrees with me. Uh, my parents disagree with me. But <laughs> um, then you must hold something like the view that Pogi and Singer are maintaining, right? Because you think that if we have the income distribution, let's say a ladder from absolutely bottom of the barrel poor to the absolute richest rich, right? The person in North Carolina who's losing their job due to outsourcing, that person is it's all the way up. It's somewhere here, right? In, in the international ladder of distribution of so that job is going to go to someone who is way lower. Right? And it's going to go up more than that person is going to go down, probably. Because they might go from a couple of dollars a day to what in their society might be somewhat decent wage. And this person is going to go down from a job that's rewarding and pays and that you know, comes with a lot of benefits to something worse, which sucks, but not nearly as bad as what that person is doing. They got to live in North Carolina. They, still, they might draw unemployment benefits. They might be able to retrain themselves. Might be able to find a new job, and, and so on. So, if you say I actually prefer dealing with this person up here than with that person, like making sure that this person doesn't go a little bit down, even if it means that this person down there doesn't get to go up, what you have to say is that you're in some relation to this person that matters more. Right? It can't be just like how good or how well off or how poorly off are you. That's the thing I prefer to look at. But if you disagree with that, then we have to say, well, I have some special reason to prefer this person over that person. Well, what might that be? Well, the obvious answer is, well, you're, you're you know, a fellow citizen or something, right? Like you're an American and they are an American, something like that. And that's exactly the thing. That, that argument is a very popular argument. It might be the right argument. Even though I would disagree with you, that might be the right argument. But it is the one that, that's exactly the thing that Singer and Bogey are attacking. Mm -hmm. So far, so good? We'll see, actually, how Altman and Wellman hold a version of that view, right? They will defend um, the thing that I'm objecting to. They'll say, actually, you can actually prefer that person that's higher up and lower down. All right, so we start Singer and then Pogi. Um, probably we'll spend most of our time today on Singer. Um, Singer is. You, probably, you might have known about this before coming here. It's very famous. He's very famous, rightly so. Uh, <clears throat> this article that you read it was written in 1974, I believe, um, and it's still something that sort of that philosophers feel the need to really engage with 
people still writing, other people, everybody pretty much um, that I know who teaches a course like this or an intro to ethics course or applied ethics course will teach a version of this. So when this came out, it was a game changer. And Singer drew our attention to something really important. But it's one of the reasons why it draws so much attention is that it has this combination of two puzzling, well, neither, there's two things going on here, neither of which is puzzling, but the combination is puzzling. And the, the, the combination is, it starts with a very, very intuitive idea, something that pretty much everyone you'll ever talk to, if you put them on the spot and ask them, what do you think, they say, yeah, I agree with this idea, this, this intuition about this child drowning in the pond. And then he says, well, if you believe that, then you must also logically believe something that almost nobody believes, right? which is that you really bad well, you could give away almost all of your money. Right? And that's not puzzling. You think, no, that's ridiculous. Why would I believe that, right? But then he shows there is a connection between these two, and that's the puzzling thing, right? He thinks he has an argument that if you believe the stuff about the pond, you should also believe the stuff about giving away your money. And he might be right, in which case, Change your, change your ways, right? Stop buying iPhones, stop buying fancy clothes or whatever, like sell your car, stuff like that. <laughs> um, we'll get to that. Or maybe he's wrong, but if he's wrong, then you have to show what's the step that's, where does the chain break, right? Where, where is the difference between the drowning child and giving away your money? And he thinks there is no difference. And so you'll have a, if you're smart, right? So you have a hack of a fight to fight. Figure that out. So, so, you start with the drowning pond, right? So you're walking down the street, there's a pond, you just beat some water, right? There's a child in there, can't swim, it's in the water, you're, I don't know how it got in there, but it's in there, right? Splashing around, save me, save me, right? And he says, you should sprint, you should jump, you know, will you jump in and save the child? Now, doing so won't be free, right? You might be wearing, maybe you're on your way to a job interview or something, you're wearing a nice suit or a nice dress or whatever, right? Like some, some fancy shoes. Um, so let's say it costs you 500 bucks, you know, you're going to go wade in the water, it's muddy, it's dirty, it's the right thing and won't help, right? That's, it's ruined. So it's going to cost you about 500 bucks, let's say that that's how much you're wearing, by right? You're going to destroy $500, lose $500 of value, but you save the child. And he thinks, pretty much anyone thinks that you should go <coughs> That's a claim, right? He, thinks, he says, that's what you will believe. Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone, anyone want to say at this point, want to hit the brakes and say, no, I don't believe that. You have to go in. There's strengths, right? There's flavors of this claim, right? You might think that, you might think, well, I'm the kind of person who would go in, but I don't think that I can expect others to go in. That's one version which you might step down, right? You might say, well, if somebody else won't go in, I won't hold it against, and won't say they did anything wrong, but I would actually just make the sacrifice. There's a version why you might say, well, nobody has to go in, I won't do it either, but I don't think you passed that state, I don't think anyone here is that person. So maybe, does anyone believe that other people don't have to do it, but you would do it? So, so hold on. So you think so? Should they jump in or should they not? Don't they have to jump in? I'm not sure what you're saying. Wait around and look and see if anyone's going to jump in first. No, I'm not going to wait. Right, right. Yeah, you wouldn't. Yeah, that would be a good idea not to wait around and look at whether some other poor soft will first ruin their suit. Right, you should probably just make sure the kid is safe first. But if they don't, let's say that they don't do it, would you hold? Would you say like, hey? That was wrong. You guys should like, so let's say that you're walking. There's a child dining in the pond, and there's there's this guy in a nice suit, and he's looking. He's not jumping. Right? So, act first, ask question later. So you jump in, get the kid out, and then you ask him, "Hey, what, what the hell? Why, why weren't you jumping in? Can you swim? Right? Maybe if you can't swim, then he would drive himself. Okay, right? But no, no, I can swim. <laughs> so why didn't you jump in? Well, I have this $500 suit on. I'm not ruining $500 for the kid. Would you think that he would do something wrong? Yeah, right. Okay, so. Chantal, you your hand up? Right, so okay, so there's a, that was one way we could avoid it, right? You might think, well, I would be the kind of person who would jump in, but if I think about it, it's really not something that you have to do. But if you believe that, then you wouldn't blame anyone who doesn't, who doesn't jump in, right? You say, well, they don't have to. It's just different for me. Well, we don't really believe that. You think they, they, that's 
messed up. They should get back on the box. It hurts, but they should have jumped in. Um, maybe you think it would just like everybody who is a decent person would jump in, and so if they don't jump in, then that shows that they're not a decent person. But that's one thing to say that they have to jump in, that they must do it, is something even stronger. So maybe you think. We can make a distinction between something you have a duty to do, like an obligation, you must do, and something that you just would do if you're really good or a nice person. So the person that $500 suit there, we wouldn't say they did something wrong. We just say, well, they're they're just bad as a person, but they, but it's it's up to them ultimately to jump in. Would anyone say that? Chantal. Right. So, I mean, yeah, fair enough, right? <laughs> um, for the sake of the argument, just to get the, it's a thought experiment, right? So we're trying to test the intuition to make sure that there's not too many distractions going on. It's like a philosopher's move, but for now, right? Let's assume that it's, if you're going to call, it's going to be too late, right? The kid will have brown. And let's assume that even if you take off your suit, fold it up nicely on a bench or something, that the mud doesn't hit it, like that's too late, right? So it's a kind of, hmm. the point being, not to just sort of make it silly, there's some fun in that, but um, the point being, you want to set up the, the choice to be between saving and incurring the cost. Right? So, because that's how he's going to extend it later, right? He's going to say, hey, you can save people by donating the $500 instead of ruining the suit. It's the same choice. Right? So that's how the argument's going to get extended. So that's why we're setting up, well, he's setting up the thought experiment that way, right? Like, well, you can. If you call, it's going to be too late. So really, the choice you're facing in that moment is: kid is drowning. Go in, but lose the $500 suit, or don't, and then keep the $500 suit, but the life is is lost. Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm right about this or not, um, but if someone is dying and you are there and you're watching and you have me to prevent that death, isn't it illegal to not act? Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, so it depends what state you're in. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there's a couple this, um, I think in France, in terms of country, in, in France, there, I think there might be one in Vermont. I'm not sure. Yeah. Vermont, yeah. yeah. Well, they're, they're, yeah. Called, like, they're called bad Samaritan laws. So the idea being that if you're not a good Samaritan and jump in, then you might be liable to be punished. Don't hold me to it, but <laughs> first of all, jump in, right? <laughs> if you do see it. I don't think so, no, I'm pretty sure that. I thought it was involuntary manslaughter. Like, you can go to prison by not saving someone if you have a chance to. That's involuntary manslaughter. In North Carolina? I think in the United States. Uh, I just thought it was just like the whole state. Oh, I thought it was a statewide thing. Oh, anyway, so. Is there any you have it? Well, is there any I believe the Netherlands doesn't have one of these. I was pretty sure that it was a state level thing in the US, but now that you're saying that, I, like I don't take my word for it, so maybe Google it. But, um, I was pretty sure about the Vermont thing, and you confirming it makes me even more sure. <laughs> Right. And because I took a CPR class and certified, I legally was supposed to stop at any. Right. That is something that I know that is in many, in more places. So I know in the Netherlands, for example, if you're, if you're a medical professional, then that that law applies. But for an ordinary, like non-medical professional citizen like me, you wouldn't, really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be criminally punishable. For it. So like if it's manslaughter, then you're, that's high up on the totem pole of criminal punishment. Anyway, um, but even if it is illegal, there we, there's still the further question of um, is, the, is the law right to do this or not? Is this 
morally justifiable or not. Sometimes laws do do, do things that are well. Often laws do things that are right. <laughs> Sometimes they do things that are not right. Yes. Yeah, Right, okay, good. Yeah. A uh, singer would agree with you, right? So not morally is it morally it's not okay to let someone die. I suppose you mean like as long as you can sort of prevent it in a, in a way that's not ridiculously dangerous or something, right? So if the waters are shark infested or something, right? Then okay, then there's so much danger to yourself that maybe that prohibits like blocks what would otherwise be the right thing to do, which is jumping. Or if you can't swim, right? Or Maybe if you think about it, maybe if you have a million dollar suit on. Right? Um, so I don't know, right? But I don't know where, where the line is going to be, but at some point it might be too expensive, too costly uh, to do it. Right? Um, tricky question, right? But, let's see, but if it's 500 bucks, you probably should, be, uh, uh, probably should be doing it. Maybe it depends on how rich you are. Right? These are and these are things, so Singer would agree with you. Singer thinks, generally speaking, if you can prevent just an innocent person dying, and you can do that in a way that is not like really harming yourself or harming someone else in the process, then morally that's the right thing to do. Come here. <laughs> just your swimming, just your swimming pants. You mean? Walking around in flippers and. Um, well, I mean, one of the points that, that Singer does make, if you, if you remember, the, when he has the two principles, is he think he accepts that there's a cutoff point. And the cutoff point is like one, like if you start sacrificing something in the act of saving, that is either of a greater moral value than what you actually saved. Or something that it just hits the threshold of really, really important, like something that's really important, even if it's not greater, then the obligation doesn't apply anymore. So a lot of people who believe this think that there is some type of cutoff point, right? You think, well, um, I think of forget about the million dollar suit, right? Because you maybe think, well, a suit is going to be frivolous. Now, think about like somehow, I don't know exactly how this works, but jumping in would mean like you destroy your kid's college fund or something like that. Right? Eh. Is, it, is saving a life that important that you should sacrifice your kid's educational future? Maybe, maybe not. It's, it, at least it's a little more, it takes a little more thinking before we get to the, get to an answer than $500. Right. Right. Now maybe the college fund is not, maybe that you think if I have upon reflection you really should sacrifice that too. Well how about everything? Right. Like you just end up destitute afterwards. At that point Singer even would say, well if you end up with absolutely destitute afterwards, <coughs> Then no, they can't expect you to make yourself that poorly off. The person who's drowning cannot. If you were if you were drowning, right? You saw a person running, and they said, "Can't jump in. Why not? Because I would lose everything I have." Then maybe you would accept it. You accept their answer. Maybe not in the moment because you're freaking out, right? But <laughs> from a distance, maybe you would accept their accept their answer. I was going to say that um, the question he has is like a child drowning. How does a child drowning? I think pretty much, I agree with him, pretty much anybody, no matter what it is, you can't, whatever, you got a million dollars to, you would jump in and save a child, because a child really can't fend for itself, or even if you couldn't swim, you would still try to save a child. Now, if it's an adult, maybe it would be different if you have a million dollars to, or say you didn't like that person, and they were drowning, or something like that, and you might think about it, like, oh, okay, oh well. But I'm just saying, if it's a child, I think you anybody would jump and save a child. That's my opinion. Yeah, I think so. Singer, I, th I mean, Singer obviously is trying to find the example that will get the strongest reaction out of you, right? Mm -hmm. So that if you read, like, he wants, he's going to argue for a conclusion that you will very much want to resist, because right? you stand to lose a lot if you accept it. Right? And so he's trying both logically, but also psychologically, right? He's trying to get you into the argument with an idea that is really hard to give up on, right? 
Now, if he said, well, there's a, Hitler is drowning in a pond, right? <laughs> so now that's, an easy, that's fairly easy to say, well, in that case, just screw the guy, right? Like, you know, we'd, be better, we'd be better off without it. But, but that's, of course, not what he wants, right? He wants to say, well, but we're not, the, like, the third world, which, which people are, di- are dying, and we get rescued by giving them money. That's his idea. That's not full of Hitlers, right? It's full, of, it's full of children, but also adults, but people, generally speaking, who haven't done anything to end up with our lives in danger, and who you could do something to save. And now the question is, what do you do? And so he wants to, he wants to get you first to think about that in a different context, one where he thinks you will recognize what morality really requires, and then take it to another context where we, are, we have a lot of self-interest to try to resist this, he thinks, well, this out because we have we stand a lot to lose, right? Like you, and I could have bought, I mean, my clothes aren't exactly the most expensive clothes, but I could have bought cheaper clothes and sent a difference to, right? and could have bought, bought a rickety car instead of the one that I got and sent the difference to. Right? And I got an iPhone. If I could have not gotten a phone, it'd be fine. I used to have another cell phone when I was younger, right? Could have sent the money that I spent on the side, could have, and so on and so on. And all those cases are cases where I like to suit, right? where I'm asking myself, like, hey, it's nice to have a nice suit. <laughs> it will take giving up the suit to rescue this life, but if I think life is more important than the suit, then I should choose a life over the suit. Right? And so now we're in the same situation. Well, um, maybe I don't have a you know, $500 suit. I have cheap clothes on, but I have a $500 iPhone in my, in my pocket. It will get ruined by the water. Right? Well, I should choose the life over the iPhone. Right. Well, I'm in that situation right now, he says. I could choose not to have an iPhone and save, save a life by just sending the 500 bucks to third world and have someone who might catch malaria or doesn't have anything to eat, get them some food and some medicine that's not expensive. So, um, so if you think you should do it in one case, you should do it in the other. This is, and that's the, and once you see that all the way through, right, then it gets, gets very uncomfortable very quickly. Claudia, do you have your hand up a second? Yeah, um, you said that like if you remove everything, like all your money by jumping in the pond, then you would disagree with it. But I, I don't. I understood the way that, like the stronger argument you made is that if you end up in the same situation, like that's the the point where it splits up. So wouldn't that be me drowning by saving the cow? Like me losing everything, I still have my life, so I still am better off than the person who has time to say. So yeah, that good. Um, let me see. Sell that thing. Alright. Well, um, all right. Well, think about it this way. I don't have it on there. I'm just gonna draw like a little bar graph. So, one second. I think the next is that the next one. So yeah, here's the stronger. This is the one that you're talking about, right? So he has these two principles: the stronger and a weaker principle. So the stronger principle is this, right? It just says, what this intuition about the pond shows is that you believe something like these two principles. So it's going to take a step back. It says, okay, we all share this intuition. We tried that a moment ago. I asked everyone, does anyone disagree? Nobody really disagrees. So he says, well, if nobody's disagreeing, then you must believe something like this. So take a step back. Now, philosophically, what does that mean? Well, you mean that something like this principle is correct, right? You believe this is true. And there's a stronger and a weaker version. Stronger just means more demanding, right? So if it's in your power to prevent something bad from happening, like a person dying, right, that's bad, assuming that you accept that too, that seems pretty good, right, pretty safe, without thereby sacrificing something of comparable moral importance, then we ought already to do it. So that's the strongest one, right? That says, like, as long as what you're giving up is not as important as the life that's being saved, then you have to do it. Now, that's not exactly what you were saying, like it's that you have to make yourself as badly off. The idea is that um, it's like comparing the difference instead of the absolute levels. What I mean is this, right? So let's say that um, I'm really, ba- really well off, these international internationals, really, ba- really well off historically, internationally, whatever, right? I'm really ba- well off. <laughs> Life goes, is going pretty damn well. Have a job, I'm healthy. Safe, na- safe environment, and so on, right? Like, can so lucky, right? So I'm really up high here. Like, let's say that we have a bar of just how good 
We just compare good things and bad things, right? All the goodness in my life, there I am. Right? And then we have a person in the third world who's living on a dollar a day. Really, like, I can't even reach, like, the difference is so great, right? I can't even reach. <laughs> so, so I start sending 100 bucks. That gets me a little bit down. You get that person very much you know, up a lot more than I go down, right? Because if you're an economist, you know about this law of diminishing marginal utility of money. Basically, the idea is that for every dollar that you get, the next dollar is worth a little less than the first one. So you go from zero to one, that means you go from nothing to the soda. Right? Now, soda isn't the, end of, isn't the best thing in the world, but if you had absolutely nothing first, then that might actually get you through the day. Right? So you go from, from one to two. Well, now you have two soda, still tremendous, right? <laughs> tremendous improvement, but from, one to zero, from zero to one was a little bit more important than from one to two. And so you keep going on. Every dollar that you add is important, but it gets a little less important. Once you get from like a million dollars to a million dollars plus one, even though from zero to one was a big deal, from a million to a million and one, does Bill Gates even pick up a dollar anymore? You know, is that worth his time to actually bend over and pick up a dollar bill from the ground? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm not sure, right? Like it might even, like maybe he pulls a muscle. Like, I don't, like, what's the, he's got, he's got so many, he's got, he's got mountains of dollars. What does he care about the extra dollar? Now, maybe you might care about the dollar, right? A homeless person will definitely care about the dollar. And the difference is, Bill Gates has many, many more dollars, and so the next one dollar, every dollar is worth as much as, you, as the next one in the store, but to Bill Gates, because he has so much more, it's worth less. Right? So, for me, nearly like Bill Gates, right? But for me, um, a dollar is worth a lot less than to a person who has nothing. Right? So I give a hundred bucks, that makes me a little worse off. It means I have to forego some savings or expenses or whatever, right? But this person goes from zero to a hundred, which might be a third of their annual income or something, right? That's amazing. So they go up way, so I go down this much, they go up this much. I gave up another hundred dollars. Now it starts hurting a little more, right? So not, not only have I lost the first hundred, now I have to get the second hundred. The first hundred that I gave up, something trivial, but now I have to make it a little more difficult this year. This year. Okay, the trivial thing, going out for dinner with my wife or something, that I've given that up already. Now I have to actually choose, like, whatever, do I buy a toy for my kid or not? So it's a little more important, but still, not, nothing like, can I actually um, buy malaria medicine? So they go up from 100 to 100 this much, they go up from 100 to 200 this much, they go up from 200 to 300 this much, right? It starts going all the way down. The net, like the benefit from each $100 gets a little smaller. And my harm, lack of benefit, my disbenefit or something, right? It was super small, 100, 200, 300, 400. And at one point, these will be equal size. Now, it doesn't have to be that, um, that we're equally well off. It might be that for me to step from going from, say, $10,000 a year to $9,900 a year, that that step down is as big for me here as the step up is for them to going from $5,000 to $5,100. And so at that point, you have to stop on the small principle. Because then, if I continue, then I go from $99 to $98, but I'm giving up something that hurts me more than it would benefit them from, from $51 to $51. And that's irrational in things. Like, why would I, you know, why would I incur a greater harm than a, a benefit to them? So he's not saying there's something important about being exactly equal. He's just saying, let's make sure that the dollars are where they do the most good. And that's really what the strong principle says. The strong principle says, what's the right thing to do is to make sure that there is as much value to go around as So get the dollars to where they do the most good. And the saving life is just one version of that. Right? So it's not just the dollars, it's also our energy, our activities. Right? Like Generally speaking, we should make sure that we do the most good. So if there is a child drowning, you could do a lot of good by just wading in. Uh, but you can do a lot of good all the time. And so the strong principle says you should always try and do the most good. Sometimes that means do something for yourself. For example, if you go, maybe getting an education can be okay on this because you become smarter, more productive, and that means that you can do more good later on. Right? But you don't do it because you would like to do it. You do it because you're doing the most good. That's what this principle says. Now, do we? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I just had to say something. Like, whenever you apply this to international, I think the reason why a lot of this doesn't really work is not everyone donates and stuff. But if 
we saw a kid drowning in front of is different is because like, you know what mirror neurons are? Like it's like you have empathy, like whenever you mm -hmm. see someone suffering, then your brain will mirror the suffering. This is like you see a sad movie, something bad happens, you start to cry. It's because you're mirroring the, the suffering that the person in the movie is going through. And I think the empathy diminishes over distance. If someone's millions of miles away and you don't see them suffering, then the empathy is not triggering in your brain for you to feel like you're in their shoes. If I see someone drowning in front of me, uh, it's like my brain's like, uh, what if I was drowning? Right. And like, I immediately like understand like, like, what if this, I was in the same situation and it automatically kicks in for me to want to save this person because I would want to be saved. And I think that's the difference. Like, uh, empathy diminishes over distance. Good, yeah. So I think I would totally agree with what you just said. So we do empathize more with people who are close to us, who look more like us, um, who we have relationship with, who we see a lot more often, and all these things, than some stranger on a TV screen. Or worse, as someone who doesn't even make it onto a TV screen. And there's millions of them. But he's gonna ask now, that's psychology, right? That's how you actually, your brain works. But now let's ask philosophy, right? like ethics. Is that what we should do? It is not, I know that's what we do, he says, right? Now the question is, what should we do? And he thinks, well, does it make a difference that you don't empathize with them so much? Like, so let's say there's this kid drowning. The kid looks much different from me. It's uh, from, a, from a country way far across the world and so on. I've never seen this kid. <laughs> um, now, I don't empathize with the kid as much as I, w as I would with my own kid if the, uh, my own kid was drowning. Does that in any way lessen my obligation to jump in? Singer thinks, no, it's a kid. Like, save the, save, save the dang kid. So that's true for the kid in the pond. And he's going to say, well, that's true for people across the globe too, right? The fact that you don't empathize with them as much might explain why you don't do it. It doesn't justify it. And if we're looking for justifications, um, you should try and do your best to overcome your lack of empathy. Like, um, to, not to put the final point on it, but. Singer thinks we're a little bit, we're, we're sort of psychologically built to be jerks a little. <laughs> we, we prefer our own people over others, but everyone is equal. And if you really think that everyone is equally important, then, then act like it. All right, so the strongest version of that, right, is very strong, right? That really says take everybody's interest equally into account in, with your own. And it's only when you have to give up something that is, that is of more value than what you'd be creating for them that you get to stop. But Singer says, and I, I know this is really strong, actually Singer thinks deep down in, in my heart, Peter Singer, I believe that this is true. He does believe Peter Singer is a utilitarian, this is the utilitarian idea. Utilitarians think what you should do is just create the best overall outcome. And that might just mean just Whatever you think is valuable in the world, that's the stuff that you should be maximizing. But almost nobody else is a utilitarian. Singer is, but he said, but the argument doesn't require utilitarianism. Because we only start, we started with an intuition that wasn't anything like utilitarianism, was an intuition about saving a drowning child. So maybe you share my utilitarianism, great, give away a lot of money, but maybe you don't share my intuition about utilitarianism, Singer, and you have the weak principle and you just think, well, it's not that we should give up as much to the point where we would be worsening ourselves more than we'd be bettering them. But maybe you think you should jump in and save the, the kid as long as you don't give up something that is just too important. So a $500 suit is not too important, so everyone thinks you should jump in. Now, the college fund, maybe that's too important. Maybe that is too important. Right? Like it's, if you're not a full-blown utilitarian, at some point you're going to have to say this is too important, and it's okay. It's at least permissible, allow it to not to not jump in. You're going to have to face up to that moment at some point, or you believe this. So most people don't want to say that. So most people would say, well, if you know, if the only way I could save this person in Somalia is by emptying my kid's college account and sending all the money their way, that would be asking too much of me or him, my kid. And in that case, it would be okay for me not to help. But if you believe that, right, then it doesn't mean that you don't believe that you shouldn't be giving anything. Then you have to just figure out, like, what point do I hit too important? 
And he's going to ask you, well, $500 suit, is that too important? No, because we already knew that, right? We agreed on that in the beginning. He asked, does anyone think it's okay not to jump in? No, nobody said. So $500 suit, right? Okay. Does anyone here have anything that is worth $500 that they could go forego? I bet the answer is yes. Right? It's a lot of money, 500 bucks, but you can find it if you have to. So if you think that if you're wearing a $500 suit and you should have jumped in, then go out and find 500 bucks and start sending. Up to the point where it's too much to ask. And it's true for you, for me, and for everybody. And like those commercials that show videos of those homeless children, and it's like if you donate a dollar a day, you can save them. And like it doesn't, does it, um, what I'm trying to say is that like it doesn't take those principles into account. It's just like donate or you're a bad person. But they don't right. yeah. <laughs> they don't look at um, Yeah, those I mean those commercials are trying to do to you what, what sad movies do to you, right? That the, so they put the the same the, um, ASPCA does the same thing, right? They put these puppies yeah, and the these puppy. saw sad songs yeah. looking in the camera. The idea is they try to motivate you because they know that what Singer is saying is not enough. Right? Just explaining to you um, actually, by uh, spending money that would create, that would lose you some value, you could create a lot more value in animal welfare. Therefore, you ought to do it. Like that's if they put that syllogism on the screen, no one's going to give. But you have that. Yeah, you start firing up those neurons, right? You saw this sad, the sad face of the sad movie. Actually, that might actually move you. But Singer wants to say that's still not should not be an excuse. Right? If you think about what really morally speaking is the right thing to do, right thing to do <coughs> either. If you want to go in all the way, give up as much until you sacrifice more than they get, or give up to the point where you think you're being overcharged. Right? Something is too too important to give up the next thing. But it's not going to be a five hundred dollar suit, so probably not. If you you know you wait in, you lose your iPhone. Is that important enough? When yeah. you think no, then you should give up your iPhone. So it says like um, give up as much. Until you feel like you're being overcharged? So That's the weak principle, right? Until you think that now this is asking too much of me to save another life. So, you know, just a, it's a very practical theory, right? You can ask yourself, you go out of, out of class and say, tomorrow you wake up, uh, show up to, you know, to campus, and you start wandering into Starbucks or something, right? Spend three bucks on a coffee. Okay. Let's say that you can save a life, but you have to give up the Starbucks coffee. The more important to save the life, yes, well, singer says, then stop. Take those three dollars, turn around, send it. Right? And then the next decision. So of course, if you start like now, maybe it's lunchtime and you have to, you have your, if you want to make some, some, you want to have some lunch or whatever, right? you need to eat. Okay, well that's that would be too too much to ask that you don't eat. But then after after that, you want to go to the movies. Well, what's more important? So maybe you get to eat your lunch, but you, you should forego your Starbucks, you should forego the movies. Is that and the stronger principle? No, that would be, that's consistent with the weak. The stronger would also accept it, but would also accept it required to do even more. So, but the weak principle lets you off the hook sooner. I have a colleague um, at another university who used to do this um, experiment with the students where he would for the reason that the heartstrings point, like the pulling the heartstrings idea, saying, well, so it has pictures of kids, like you can act, you can get these uh, from certain NGOs that help people in poor countries, right? So like, if I give them money, like Google will help, and you can actually see it, which you print. So they print up these pictures, and they're like, they walk, walk around with this picture, and anytime you're gonna go into a Starbucks or anything else, pull out that picture, look at them in the face, and then decide, am I gonna buy the coffee or give it to you? <laughs> And then see if that would help. It didn't help much, apparently. But anyway, that was the, the idea. Was, um, that's what Singer is doing, right? He's putting you on the spot that way. Uh, Tamir? Yeah. Um, I was going to say that if you're equating uh, a child drowning to, let's say, family, um, and you're saving one person, or maybe a small group of people, with that one time, if you save them, they're dying of starvation. 
can you say then from God's revelation like today or the next month or so, but the next time they are in that same situation, you know, the next time that same child is drowning, like you put yourself in that same situation, and then if that keeps going on, like at what point do you just say, hey, let me let me stop the root cause of this child always drowning versus just Right. Yeah, so it's a good, it's a very good question, and this is a that's a version of a worry that, mo- that lots of people have about seeing this argument. Um, but let me, before we get to that, we'll get to this a little later in more detail. But um, let me give you like this. The, I'll go like to what I think is the most sing singer <coughs> style answer to what you're saying. You're walking, right? walking down the street. There is a pond. The kid is dying. Right? And you say, geez, kid, um, yesterday I was walking here and some other kid was dying and I jumped in already, right? And now there you are. Like, so, right? uh, but may, okay, maybe I'll jump in again. Okay, right? so jump in again. Now it's third day. There's another kid. And now you say, geez, kid, right? <laughs> this is going to keep going and going, right? This is the third, this is the third time already? Yeah, so, um, I mean, so I've, I've already wor- I've already ruined two suits. Here's my third, you know. Right? I mean, is that good enough to not jump in? You say like, oh, I don't know, well, whatever. I'm going to keep walking. What if it's the same kid? <laughs> well, God, <laughs> you got to tell them. Then maybe you should start <laughs> asking questions. But there's there's billions of people in the world who have a lot lot Jeez, less who are living in very extreme poverty. So we could yeah. we could do this billions of times before, or more than a billion times anyway, not billions. Maybe, but we could do this more than a billion times before we get to the same kid. And but you could just do something to remove the pond. Yeah. Because that way you remove the, the actual place where the child, the children drown. Like, just put a fence around it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, if, if I have, say, three children, I'm going to start thinking about, well, okay, this pond is empty, there's a problem. Children, I could go there or whatever. So we have to solve the pond problem, not the children problem. Isn't mm-hmm. that exactly what you're saying? Yeah. That you have to find the root instead of always being like, okay, there's people dying, we'll give them food. We have to, you know, give them opportunities to. Grow their own food, to have jobs, to like yeah, good. So that sounds that sounds very reasonable to me. It sounds to me right. But let's go da- let's go back. So so should you jump in or not? What do you mean? Well, yeah, but then after yeah, <laughs> yeah the kid is dying. I'll jump in, but then after that, I'm gonna go directly and do something about the pond. And I'm, even if it's just me getting like buying some fence and putting fence around it so that it doesn't happen again. Like obviously, I would save the child in that situation. But then after that, I would. Instead of like having the same situation happen again and again, I would immediately do something to change the, the, the actual problem. What if there's another pond just down the road and you can hear the splashing and screaming? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, that's, I mean, that's part of the. I mean, you know what? I mean, I'm trying to. I'm not sure if I'm being facetious even, but it's like the, the point. My point is like the, I I think what you're saying is right, and I think it shows something that's I think is a problem with Singer's principle. Singer thinks that these. We should really treat these principles as an iterated series right, of these individual case-by-case savings. And if you think that, and you can treat each individual case separately, then you're going to get into this problem, right? Where like, okay, this is one saving done. Okay, there's the next one saving that I need to be done, all the way up to either where I'm being overcharged, right, or I'm going to make myself worse off than I'm helping them. So that, I mean, that's so. If that's not what you if that's really not the right way to think about it, then Singer is wrong in diagnosing his own case. Right? Yeah, wouldn't it more be like a systematic problem? Like at some point it's not individual people drowning, it's a systematic problem that has to be solved. Yeah, it's a, no, for sure, right? So most, most people who live in really poor countries live there because there's something wrong with the social and political system that they live under, or the economic system, usually all of them. Right? Um, but of course, Singer wants to say, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at the end of the day, there is also, there's the, there's the person. Right? Yeah, I understand his moral perspective on this, but right. like, I just don't think that it's the same right, way to right. Right. Yeah, but it's hard to get out of this, right? So if you're not right to concentrate, but then in the meantime, if you're concentrating on something else, there is that person dying. So what do you do about it? That's not an escape, not too easy to escape that word. Sorry, Chantal, you had your hand up like five minutes ago, and I 
Starbucks or both. And whatever else, whatever else fits that sort of luxury or frivolous spending category, right? Where you're not yet being overcharged. So maybe that's not enough, is what you're saying. You can do both, right? Maybe yeah. you should. But even if there is some larger systematic problem going on and we should do something about that, Singer is still gonna say, like, okay, well we can focus on that, but don't take your eye off the ball, right? Mm -hmm. There is someone drowning and what do you what what about that person? Um yeah, Shay, no. All right, so um, going off of what everybody said, it's like, does Singer take into account like reform, for example? If a kid starts drowning and you save them, you don't go like, okay, I'll save you again if you drown. It's like where your parents um, don't go around this pool again instead of just keep coming back to save them. Because if you keep, like we were talking about being overcharged, if you, if you have like, if you save them three times and you're, and you keep, and your job allows you to wear, I mean, off, requires you to wear suits, and each of your suits are like $500. You just wasted $1,500. And yeah, that, that's like three of your suits. So that's when it starts to be a burden. And yeah, does, does he consider um, more than just saving? But as she said before, um, ways that people can make opportunities for themselves to to want to do better than other being saved like that. Yeah, uh, so I mean, this, the article that you've read is the, was the initial article, and he's published, um, even a couple of years ago, he's published a whole book on this, he's working on it. So it's a problem he keeps coming back to. So he's pretty in, in pretty detailed and sophisticated ways discussing all these other issues like system, systemic problems and worries people have about the, the possible ineffectiveness of aid. He said like, there might be a difference between pulling a kid out of a, out of a pond, which is an immediate and pretty much guaranteed saving, and giving money to UNICEF, for example, which is all but an immediate and guaranteed saving. They tell you 20 bucks will save a life, but that's not, I mean, sometimes, and sometimes it costs a lot more, and sometimes some warlord takes the 20 bucks and buys a gun with it, right? So that's, that doesn't always work out. That's, these things happen. So aid has been, has a very, um, it's, a, it's a messy history. It's a history of some really, really important and really good benefits and successes and some really important and really horrible failures. So you might think that the, the analogy from the pond to giving your money to UNICEF or whatever is not, um, is not a clear one, and it's not. But so he discusses these things, he tries to go into it, but that's a little down the line. Right? Um, if we're taking our thinking step by step, then the first thing he wants to do is establish that there is, morally speaking, this, uh, this obligation, do something you have to do. Not just something like, if you were nice, then you would do it, but I can't expect generally people, I asked you that in the beginning, right? Nobody thought that, but the, but the problem. Like, is it something you say, well, I would jump in, but I wouldn't expect anyone else to do it. Wouldn't hold it against him. He said, no, no, we would. And so he thinks, well, the moral obligation is, is gonna be, is gonna survive, right? Like, if you actually can help, you morally have to do it. So, there might be all these other things, and they are really important, but still, right? if you find yourself in that situation where you can actually save a life, and to do so would require you to forgo the next luxury spending. Not maybe for you, maybe your life is not luxurious for American standards, but internationally it's pretty darn luxurious, right? Then you should do so. All right, um, Chantal and then Reggie, okay. I'll see you. Oh, okay.
Um, yes, the answer is very simple, yes. Yeah. Uh, because it violates these principles, both, right? Even if you don't want to go all the way with a strong principle, it violates even the weak principle. So, assuming you don't think that um, the Starbucks is something that's really morally significant, significant enough to override the value of a life. So, imagine the pond example. I'm standing there with my Starbucks in my hand, and the other hand in my pocket. And Anthony shows up and he says, there was a kid drowning, why the hell aren't you jumping in? He says, well, I got this Starbucks, I don't want to get like muddy water in it. Oh. Yeah, exactly, if that's your response, <laughs> then yeah, like, yeah, singer's gonna say, you believe that the weak singer principle at least is true, maybe the same strong, but definitely the weak. Um, and you think that even if something morally bad would be enough to override my obligation, the Starbucks is not bad, okay? it's not. Um, and if it's not at the pound, then it's not, when you can just send the money to whatever organization is going to do the, do the good job. So yeah, yeah, that's wrong. So you owe it to, you owe it to them. If you remember, the, the article starts, you got to publish it into one of the most prestigious philosophy journals, uh, philosophy and public affairs. And so he starts with a philosophy, like a real philosopher's point. And he says, there's usually this distinction between charity and obligation. Right? Say that you drive your car, there's a homeless person on the street, to have like, anything helps, God bless, that time. Right? And we think that that, for that person, what is true is the, is the view that I described as, as you had in the beginning, right? Like, so, well, if you drive on, you stop at the, you say hi, and then you drive on without giving a dollar. You think, well, a nice person would give, right? And most of us give, at least some of the time. But if you don't, it's not something that's wrong. We wouldn't say, like, well, that's, that makes you think you've done something wrong. Like, you can't stop, go back, and give it. The charity usually is the thing that you should do it once in a while, um, a good person does it regularly, but it's not, it doesn't reach all the way up to obligation or requirement. <coughs> and we think about like, these type of things like UNICEF and so on in the same way, right? It's a charity. We call them charities. And he's saying that distinction is bogus. If, if a person can be saved, and that's not the type of thing that you think, well, a nice person would do it, but you're not required. No, you think you should. You have to. And if you think you have to, then not to do it is wrong. So I forgot who said it one moment ago, but there's, um, you know, every. Just oh, anyway, I may forget how exactly they, they said it. The point is, there's if you think there's a difference between killing and letting die, so that it's worse to kill a person than it is to just let them die if you can save them. Not sure that singer the singer's gonna say, like, not sure that carries as much weight. You know, like maybe it's worse, you're a worse person if you actively kill them than if you don't. But ultimately there is this thing where there is a person dying, you can prevent it from happening, and you're on the hook if you let it. <coughs> all right. So, all right. Here's the simple argument, right? It's just a three pre two premise argument. So either of these principles is true, he's going to say. The strong singer principle and the weak singer principle. So either like sacrifice everything up until the point where you're doing more harm than good, or sacrifice everything up until the point that you're being overcharged. That's the slogan version of these principles. So these are true, that's one premise. Second, these principles say like if you can prevent something bad from happening, then you ought to do it, right? So when you can actually prevent something very bad maybe avoidable debt from happening by giving some of your money, strong version, not something comparable importance or something morally important. Okay, that's the weak version. There's two people in the third world, donated to UNICEF, donated to Doctors Without Borders, donated to the Red Cross, whatever, right? Maybe that's what you can do. And so therefore, morally, you ought to give your money to these people, donated away up until the point where you reach the limit, whether that is the strong limit or the weak limit. So, simple argument. Now, so this is the thing that gives, that gets, that, 72, 74, where is that? 
that is 40 years now, right? For 40 years, philosophers have been sort of been giving fits. This has been giving us fits as a profession, right? trying to figure out like, is this really true? Because there's the puzzling thing, right? Like so, the intuition behind one was very, very obvious to all of us here. Not a problem. Everyone says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearly, the answer is yes. This is an empirical claim about the world, but uh, like you said, we see enough advertisements claiming that you know, you, was it 20 bucks you save a life, and then follows logically that you that they. But this is something nobody nobody actually acts on. Right? Or maybe Singer acts on it, but very few people act on it. And so that's the puzzling thing, right? Either we're all being horribly, horribly falling short of what we ought to be doing. <coughs> Either we are constantly, every day, when we walk into a Starbucks, or we go to the movies, or we, whatever, right? we, rent a, we rent a movie, or we buy a Netflix account, or whatever. All this crappy stuff that we do, not crappy, all this frivolous stuff that we're doing, it is exactly the same, morally speaking, as walking past a pond, where there's a kid drowning, right? So they got a movie to catch. Or my, don't want to get my coffee for it, right? That's one possibility, that, that we live in a world that at that that messed up, that we as people are that messed up. Right? The argument is sound, so this conclusion is true, and that's the world we live in, that's the people we are. Or, <laughs> that's one possibility, the other possibility is something is wrong with the argument. Now logically it's valid, so either, either one or two has to be false, maybe both. But we already saw, right? <laughs> one we are all accepting, yeah, 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 it looks fine. And then two seems true at some cost. So where do you get out? That's the that's why this is a really important philosophical exercise, right? It's trying to whichever way you go, you will have learned something. Right? You will either learn something that you have like something morally important where you should change the way you live pretty drastically. That's if you accept the argument. Or if you don't accept the argument, then something that we started out saying, well, this is clearly true, turns out to be not true. It turns out to be false. So either these principles are not true, or, um, or maybe we, can, we can't do anything, empirically speaking. There's nothing we can do. Yeah? Wouldn't the, uh, this view kind of like destroy like, capitalism, though? Like, because no one ever went to buy a Starbucks, Starbucks would collapse. No one went to buy like all these different things, and like uh, tons of American companies would shut down. Yeah, um, they might. Yeah, but then same question, right? So what's more important? Um, so Starbucks would close, but uh, thousands of people's lives would be saved. So are you telling me? So this is me, my singer, with my singer hat on, right? So my singer is saying, are you telling me that Starbucks is more important than these thousands of people's lives? Probably not. Right. So, and, well, then maybe that's yeah. So we live on this horrible world, he thinks, where we choose luxury things like Starbucks over life, literally. Um, Reggie, I don't know you. Oh, Joe, we shut up. You can. Yeah. Um, I keep skipping over you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so, with the whole Starbucks shutting down. Yeah. Yeah. So next week we'll look briefly at an article by uh, David Schmitz, who's argued against this, and he makes a similar point. And he thinks um, he thinks while well, Starbucks shuts down, maybe that's not so bad, right? But then of course the people who were working at Starbucks are without jobs, and so that means the money they were making, they were they were spending at uh, Harris Teeter. Well, they're not doing that anymore, so now Harris Teeter has to shut down, right? And so now we have people without stuff. So the whole. And the point is not that this will be like if if I don't buy a Starbucks, the whole society will collapse. It's clearly not true. Right? But the point is more like well, we cannot, as a rule, accept that everyone ought to do this without without society except collapsing. So that's the thought. And then, of course, that's not a, we're not yet out, right? Like so, okay, well, why not? <laughs> what we're saying now maybe 
something maybe starts looking a little more fishy about these principles. And then Claudia, you brought that up earlier already, of course, that you thought the principles seem, seem fishy. Maybe. Yeah, Reggie? I was going to say number one is the, the stronger principle, I would, I would go with that one and go with the weaker principle because if you give up everything, then you're going to be the same person, the same predicament right. that person is in, and then nobody is able to be helpful. Everybody has nothing. Right. Yeah, to... very few people accept the strong principle, but keep in mind, the weak principle already requires way more than, I don't know you, I don't know how much money you give away, but way more than most people give away. Uh, yeah, but... The... Probably most people, if not everyone in this room, that includes me. Yeah, so the, the weaker principle say, because I know in the book it say like if you give five dollars and another person gets five dollars, and then like a, some per, some people don't give five dollars, so then you would not have enough to give away. But if you gave five dollars, then you will be doing your part. Yeah, so good. He, do, he does talk about that, um, but he does also think like if other people don't do their part, it's you should probably do more. Yeah. yeah. So like to say that if everybody jumped in like this. 30 people here, 30 pawns with 30 children dying. I've jumped in, I've done my part. If everybody jumped into one pond, all kids would be safe. But turns out all of you are jerks, you don't jump into any, right? So what should I do? I should say, well, I've saved one, now I'm going home. No, I should probably try to keep this right. So he thinks you should keep doing this. And so if five everybody spending $5 would have been enough to, to rescue dying people in the world, great. But we're not yet there. So in the meantime, start paying. And I should get 10. Yeah, yeah, well, it's not going to stop at 10, right? So the weak principle says morally significant. So it's going to stop at the point where maybe you can't pay for your own education anymore, something like that. You can't pay for food anymore. Maybe you can't. Maybe a car in our society is important enough that it would str like strangle your life so much that. But your cable probably give that up. Right? That's 100 bucks a year, or a month maybe, or something. You just ship that out. Like, that's not. That's not that important. Starbucks, if you whatever, keep so I, I can keep going, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, Jeff, and I'll cut quickly. Then, um, you guys can okay, all right. All right. Um, Anthony, then we'll come, I'll talk to you after class because we are went over time. So, I haven't talked to Jeff yet. All right, so um, next time, more of this.